48 gig DIMMs here, and my dream of 192 gigabytes on a 16 core system can finally be realized, right? Not if you're on AM5. Might be a different story on LGA1700, that's going to be a different video. But man, we did the video on 128 gigabytes on AM5 a little while ago, and you could kind of do it, but it was going to run kind of slow. It was going to train at, you know, 3600, 3600 mega transfers for memory that's JETIC capable of 4800. Maybe the promise of a Giza updates or something like that would bring us along. Well, all of these systems are now rocking a Giza 1.0.0.7, and while they didn't explicitly say, hey, that's the version that we're going to have memory that's fixed in, uh, the thing that prompted me to do this video was uh, the fact that we're now limited to 1.3 volts on the SOC. For some of the users on our forum and some of my past videos, I'd actually recommended setting a 1.35 VSOC to achieve stability with 128 gigabyte memory kits. And now, with 48 gigabyte memory kits, I literally cannot get the system to post if you have four of these. But simultaneously, almost paradoxically, Two 48 gig DIMMs running at DDR5-6000 is the best high memory experience. I mean, 32 gigabytes, head and shoulders above 64 gigabytes, gives you 96 gigabytes of memory. You get 32 gigabytes more than you could have had before. That's pretty awesome, right? Let's dive in a little bit more completely, because there's also some really interesting stories around the VSOC here. Now, I've got memory kits that we purchased from Crucial, G-Skill, Corsair, Team Group, A-Data, and more. I'll tell you right now, if you're gonna run four DIMMs, don't even bother with gamer memory. You probably should run something like the Crucial kits. Crucial actually has a less than $300 48 gigabyte DDR5 kit. You're not gonna achieve really high speeds with this, so you might as well just get the OEM kit, right? Yeah, probably. The other thing is if you want to mix kits in general, and this isn't anything to do with 48 gigabytes, but just the landscape of, okay, let's say that you bought two 16 gig DIMMs and you're gonna add more DIMMs later. If you add mismatched DIMMs, my relatively anecdotal experience here is that you're gonna have a lot harder time getting your system to maximum speed and stability with a mixed DIMM configuration. Now I've got our ASRock Tai Chi set up here and our MSI B650 and our Crosshair Hero X670E. We've got the B650E Aorus Master, as well as the Elite AX, two boards from Gigabyte, which I'm happy to report basically have identical behaviors, but there's an interesting thing with the Gigabyte behaviors that we'll get to. So let's take these one at a time, starting with our B650E Aorus Master. The uh, thing to understand here is that there's the VSOC thing, and the VSOC voltage is now clamped at 1.3 volts. And I don't want to get too into the weeds with this video, but the fact that that is clamped at 1.3 volts, I've sort of discovered it doesn't really matter for memory compatibility, at least in two dim scenarios, which is great. It's fabulous. Now, with these boards, when they first train, they start with a cleared CMOS, and the F4 version of the BIOS on this seemed to start with an absurdly high 1.4 something volts on the SOC. For the ask and the measure, there's three VSOC readings here that all of these boards feature. There is the AMD configuration. The board is configured to ask the SOC uh, for this voltage, or the, the, the voltage is configured and the board is asking for this voltage. The VRM will deliver that. That's what the CPU is going to receive. Then most of these boards feature a third-party chipset that does voltage reading. Most of the time it's from Nuvaton. Asus has their own special sauce one. In fact, when you run Hardware Info 64, it pops up and gives you the warning. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But there's a secondary chip on here that doesn't have anything to do with AMD or the chipset or anything. It's often the same between Intel and AMD motherboards that the motherboard vendor uses to read information about, okay, what's the 3.3 volt rail doing? What's the 12 volt rail doing? What's the VSOC rail doing? Sometimes those chips do not probe for the voltage in the most optimal place. You have to probe the voltage at the socket. If you use the probes at the front edge of the motherboard, some of these boards have voltage probe headers, you're not necessarily going to get an accurate reading. So for us, we try to use calibrated voltmeters soldered in directly at the socket or as close to the socket as we could possibly get. And so that gives us our third SOC reading. The ask, 
the reading from the Nuviton chipset, and then what we actually measured with a voltmeter. Three of those, and in a bunch of different scenarios. First, the out-of-the-box scenario. With the older BIOS on this, it seems as though the board remembers the last VSOC used. I was talking to Steve at Gamers Nexus about this, and he hypothesized that maybe as part of the quality control process, if Gigabyte is testing with really high-speed memory, when you get your board in, if your memory doesn't really necessarily have that, auto uh, would use the last SOC that was there. That's a plausible theory. I tried to recreate that on newer BIOSes at least, and if that was a bug, that seems like that has been fixed. I also tried clearing the CMOS on our Gigabyte B650E Aorus Master as well as our Elite AX and seeing if I could reproduce it. Frustratingly, in the BIOS, it doesn't show you the SOC voltage, it's just blank. But it does have other voltages there, that's like the DDR voltage and the, it seems like it's reading from a probe and that kind of thing. This is not an insanely egregious omission, especially if they fixed it in a BIOS update that came after F4 because F4 is pretty ancient. Uh, it was not doing it on the BIOS versions from January, and it wasn't doing it from the BIOS versions from May of 2023, so should be good there. Definitely use your, your BIOS flashback. 48 gig DIMMs is also another reason to use your BIOS flashback. A lot of these boards do not support 48 gig DIMMs until May of 2023. You're going to need a BIOS from May of 2023. If you get your fancy 48 gig DIMMs and your system won't post, chances are you need a BIOS update, and you're going to have to go through the BIOS flashback procedure. Happy to report all the boards that we tested here, they definitely do that. I would say with my very limited sample size of two different Gigabyte motherboards that had a reproducible VSOC bug, but not as egregious as the ASUS bugs, which we will talk about, this is probably B-. When we turn on Expo with our Gigabyte kit, we get an ask of 1.3 volts, our Nuviton reading is 1.32 volts, 1.33 volts, something in there, and our measurement at the board, 1.33 volts, 1.330 to 1.332. That's pretty good. I don't think that's bad, and I'm pretty sure that AMD is on top of this, and if it is bad, we'll know in a future update when the voltage is reduced to 1.25 volts. Uh. It's also worth noting that as we do our testing, you have different kits that are rated at, you know, this is 5600, 5800, 6000, 6200, 6600. In prior BIOSes, a lot of these systems would ask for 1.35 to 1.4 volts when you were beyond 6000, but almost all of these boards would only ask for 1.25 to 1.3 volts if you were exactly at 6,000 and less than 6,000 like a Jetpack standard like 4,800 you're more in the like 1.1 to 1.2 volt range. Now our Gigabyte board was imperfect in that it did initially set a 1.2 volt VSOC uh, voltage but that produced crashes. It was, in, it was unstable, it didn't really work. I manually set the VSOC voltage to 1.3 volts and then it was stable and fine. I actually got slightly more than 1.3 volts. All right, clear the CMOS, manually set the VSOC voltage to 1.1 volts, clear the CMOS again, booted it up, and this time it trained to 1.29 volts, ask. Actual was 1.31 volts, and that was stable. A Little bit of an odd training behavior there. Not bad. I don't think if you got 1.3 volts on the training, you're good. But if you get instability, and the graphical artifacts came from the iGPU, then, uh, Something, yeah, something, something's not right. You got to look at that. Now, our MSI Mag B650M on the A52 BIOS was pretty well behaved. This is the only other system that, without Expo enabled, was able to train our 48 gigabyte memory kit to one volt or less. Very impressive MSI. And it was also stable. Before updating the BIOS, running an A20 BIOS before A52, with our 6600 kit, it would ask for 1.35 volts. A 6000 kit, it would ask for 1.3 volts, or it would train at 1.3 volts. I don't know if it's a lookup table to say, okay, the memory is this fast, let's do this, or if it's an artifact of the memory training procedure. Honestly, not sure, but just FYI. There's a lot to like about MSI's implementation. They also have memory try it, which is useful when you're trying to dial in settings, which is definitely something I recommend if you're gonna run DDR5 4800, because technically there are not any DDR5 4800 kits that are designed for Expo. If you have the choice of Expo or XMP, definitely opt for Expo for DDR5. This, that's something this experience has taught me, is like, well, if you've got an Expo kit, and you're, you're going for something high-end, like dual 48 gig DIMMs, uh, you might as well just get the Expo kit, because this is uh, not a lot of fun. Moving along to our Azeroc Tai Chi. Now this one is interesting. On the old BIOS, it would train to 0.96 volts. 
But since the BIOS update and since the memory kit may be just the insanity of me poking at it, it seemed to only want to train in non-expo modes when you clear the CMOS and everything else at about 1.01 to 1.05 volts, give or take. I never saw the 0.96 to 0.94 after I did the BIOS update to the May BIOSes, the, the Agiza 1.0.0.7. I'm not saying they're related, I'm just saying that's an interesting observation. So out of the box defaults with this before you enable expo are 1.01 volts as the ask, 1.024 as what's delivered, and 1.020 as what we actually measured at the socket. So it's riding a little high, but not excessively so. When we enable expo, we're getting an ask of 1.3 volts, and a reported of 1.312 volts, and a measured of 1.310 volts. So, not bad. Now save the best for last, our X670E Hero. This one is a weird one. With our 96 gigabyte kit, with no expo or anything else like that enabled, and running the latest May BIOS 1410, putting our 48 gig kit in here, it trains to 1.2 volts. When you enable DOCP1, it takes a little while for the training to complete, and then, interestingly, in Hardware Info 6.4, it says that it's asking for 1.296 volts for the VSOC, and the reported voltage on the Nuviton controller is 1.29 something, it's, it, it varies a bit depending on the uh, measurement. But then when you actually measure it on the board, it's 1.33 to 1.35. So it's riding a little high in terms of at the socket measurement. And the X670 Hero has a little pad right next to the CPU socket. I'm not 100% sure that's the best place to measure the voltage going into the CPU, but it does seem that the ASUS board is just a little high in terms of what it actually delivers to the socket and what is actually measured by the Nuvoton controller, or by, I'm sorry, by ASUS's controller, which shows up in Hardware Info 64. Now, anybody that runs Hardware Info 64 and pretty much any ASUS board gets this warning from Hardware Info 64 that's like, hey, this can cause performance issues and things will get weird and it's because the thing takes up the bus. It's not really well implemented. I mean, we got three competing boards here and Hardware Info 64 doesn't feel the need to give you a warning on those, but on the ASUS one, it does. Mm, it's it's not a good look, and that's been a thing that's been happening for years. It's just some of the ASUS cruft here is just the accumulation of a million little things, and finally the straw breaks the camel's back. I don't know, but it will work with two 48 gig DIMMs. Now, it's not all bad news about four DIMMs. If you're willing to get your hands dirty, it is possible to achieve four 48 gig DIMMs. It's just not going to happen automatically. The secret to this, as it turns out, is to get it working with two DIMMs, don't enable Expo, set your SOC voltage to like 1.25, 1.3 volts manually, and then add the other two DIMMs. <laughs> of course, in this case, 1.2 volts wasn't enough for 4X 48 gig, gig DIMMs, so it didn't do them any good anyway. But dialing it up to 1.3 volts exactly, throwing in my 48 gig DIMMs, and then playing with the timings was enough to actually get it going. So it's not just the timings, but it's also the memory termination values. Hope your BIOS lets you change that. Uh, you're gonna probably have to use like the Zen timings utility and really get your hands dirty. There's fortunately there's a forum thread on the level one forums you can dive into. Maybe we can help figure it out. Some people that are far more talented than I am have been able to achieve four DIMMs 5600 128 gigabytes yeah good lord first reply on that post that gave me the encouragement and the will to live good job good sir ah, i'm breaking all my own rules and doing all the things i'm telling you not to do i've got two mismatched dims in here it's the worst case scenario it's ancient corsair dominator memory from the launch of ddr5 plus our new 48 gig dims from g skill it's about the worst case scenario you can expect in terms of voltages, in terms of dim configuration, in terms of timings and subtimings, even desired resistance, like the termination resistance is not even really the same between these two. It's a mess, but look closely. They're grouped together on a channel. Most people don't realize this is a thing, but because you want to put your dims on separate channels so that it runs in dual channel mode, but when you have four dims, sometimes the rules can change. So I've got my like dims on channel A and my like dims on channel B. That means that when I'm doing something in dual channel, I'm getting something out of each different DIM. This can be easier from a memory training standpoint, and certainly if the platform supported it, you could support even different voltages going into different DIMs. You can't do that on AM5, but it does make it a little easier from a training and bring up perspective. As you can see, I've got 160 gigabytes of memory here, mixing our ancient kit and our new kit. Now, it trains at 3600, and with some manual tuning, 
I can get it up to 4400, but that's still nowhere near as good as what you can get from just, you know, the crucial reference kit for 48 gig DIMMs with four 48 gig DIMMs running at like, you know, 5400 is doable. It's just a lot of work and tuning and you have to have the best motherboard and also the best chip. So it's not a fun process. It's just the automatic processes for this are, are kind of busted. So if you find yourself watching this video for some troubleshooting hints or steps, I can try to help you. You have to understand that there's a lot of variables here. It's like a recipe. You've got your motherboard, you've got your processor, and you've got your memory, sure, but also how you've installed your memory physically, like inserted into the slot, that can vary from insertion to insertion. The specific memory kit or kits that you have and how those go together, even if you bought a, a full four DIMM kit, individual DIMMs within the kit can vary. So there's a lot of hidden variables here that you don't understand necessarily. There's three voltages that are in play. VSOC is the one that gets all the press, but as we have shown in our experimentation, VSOC is not the end-all be-all for stability and compatibility when we're talking about memory. You've also got VDDQ and VDDIO. If you look at the label on your memory, it'll say I want 1.2 volts or 1.25 volts or 1.3 volts or even 1.35 volts. That's the dim voltage. It's related to, but it is not the VSOC voltage. Those are different voltages. They're not the same thing. It might look unusual here because I've got my DIMMs grouped up together, my Corsair on one side and my Trident Z from G-Skill on the other side, but this is an easier proposition from a training standpoint for your motherboard. Yeah, putting Leica DIMMs on a given channel. This is channel A, this is channel B. It's gonna be easier for your motherboard to post and do that. You can run two different DIMMs on a single channel, but it's a little more challenging from an initial post standpoint. If you find yourself having installed all four DIMMs and getting no post, what I would suggest you do is install two of your DIMMs, get that to post, and then you can experiment with your, your, uh, your DIMM voltage, the actual DDR voltage. You can also set your VSOC voltage. I don't recommend starting with anything higher than 1.2 volts. If you don't need anything more than 1.2 volts, you're gonna have extra heat and stability if you immediately jump to 1.3. If after setting your, your dim voltage to 1.2 or 1.25 or whatever it wants, your VSOC to 1.1, 1.15, 1.2, .1, and it's still not stable, then you can try 1.25 or even up to 1.3 to see if that gives you the att attainability, the, the stability that you desire. When you're running four dims, you can pretty much forget an Expo profile it's not going to happen, but once you've got stability with the automatic training and the voltages, knowing that it's not necessarily going to dial in a voltage more than you know 1.15, 1.2 necessarily, depending on which which board you have, and any kind of automatic training and automatic training for four dims may not work. Doesn't mean that you can't use four dims. Just means that you're going to have to do a little bit of extra work, which is why you're watching the troubleshooting part here. Then you can try to get your speeds and other things faster. It helps if you mess with the frequency, the timing, and also the termination strength. These are uh, complicated topics for another video, but you're on the path. <laughs> if you weren't posting before and now you're posting with four DIMMs, uh, hopefully that's a start and you can go from there to more speed and more stability. I'm one of those level one. This has been a look at 48 gig DIMMs, which are really, and keep in mind the DIMMs that I'm testing for this are not Expo DIMMs. So if you're watching this in the future, things may have changed and Expo DIMMs changed everything and 192 gigabyte kits that you know memory vendors would sell may have changed everything. And it's like, oh, well you can do 192 gigabytes on AM5. You just have to get the kit of 192 gigabytes designed specifically for AM5 and be running at least the 2024 version of the BIOS. I don't know, but I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out and you can find me in the Level 1 forums.